Uh, last week, uh, you looked at Christ's Lordship reflecting his goodness. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, so this week, it falls to me to preach from Matthew 7. So if you've got Bibles or tablets or phones, I use a phone personally myself these days. <laughs> but uh, somewhere where you can read the Bible at least. Um, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And I've simply named my message, Rejoicing with the King on the Narrow Way. Amen. Because we're looking at the kingdom and we're looking at kingdom living. And Jesus Christ is our King. He's the King of love. He's the King of peace. He's the King of righteousness. He's the King of everything. Amen. And we're just going to look at what he has to say to us regarding these scriptures. So, I think I better get my glasses on. Probably help. <laughs> so, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad and easy to travel is the path that leads to the way of destruction and eternal loss. And there are many who enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow and difficult to travel is the path that leads the way to everlasting life. And there are few who find it. That's from the Amplified Bible version, just to say, if you're reading different versions. I like that, because it kind of explains it a bit more. So, this morning we're going to look together at the narrow way. Plain and simply, initially this may sound like a difficult topic, but maybe it is, maybe it's not. But actually, it's really, really encouraging to think about it. So, thinking about the narrow way, we're going to consider just a few things. Three things mainly. Though this is described as a difficult path to travel, it is the right path. Yeah, it's the right path. It might be difficult, but it's the right path. Secondly, though there is a cost to traveling on this path, it leads to a wonderful destination. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A wonderful destination. So it might cost to travel on it. But there's a wonderful destination. And that is everlasting life. And lastly, though few find the narrow path, if we travel on it, we will have a companion every step of the way. Jesus, our Savior and King. He will be with us every step of the way. Not just some of them, but every single one of them as we travel on the narrow way. Firstly, let me ask you a question. How is your journey progressing? That's the first question. If you're following Jesus, if you're on the narrow way, you're on a journey. There is a progression that goes on if we're following, if we're moving. Did you think when you set your feet on the narrow way, that the journey would be anything like what you've experienced so far? Good question, isn't it? When you decided to follow Jesus, did you think it would be like that when you stepped onto the narrow way? Sometimes we've got different ideas of what the Christian life is like, <clears throat> but the Bible is very, very definite and direct about our Christian walk. So I can tell you, it's not like I thought it would be. Personally, I'll not say any more than that. I'll just say it. it's not like I thought it would be. It's very different. Are you finding the way difficult? Is your path to eternal life set with temptations, battles, and struggles? Are you beset on every side by troubles? Are you cast down and hard pushed? Are there times of heartache and confusion in your life? Are you almost despairing? at times. Are there times that you question, you actually question the reality of God and whether you're saved or not? Do these thoughts come into your mind? And does it feel that you're constantly pushing against the tide? Does this world feel like it's becoming an increasingly alien place for you to live in? Do you feel like that at times? If these are some of the things you're experiencing on your journey through this wilderness, because that's what this earth is, it's a wilderness. We're traveling through it. This isn't our destination. 
we are moving on, hallelujah, with our king, we're moving on to higher ground. So if those are some of the things that you're experiencing, be encouraged. These things indicate that you are on the right path. You're not on the wrong path. You are on the right path. So these are indicators that you're on the right path, not the wrong path. Listen to the Apostle Paul describing his daily struggles from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, we are pressured in every way, hedged in, but not crushed, perplexed, unsure of finding a way out, but not driven to despair, hunted down and persecuted, but not deserted to stand alone, struck down, but never destroyed, always carrying around in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the resurrection life of Jesus also may be shown and our bodies. So you're in good company. That's what he experienced on a daily basis. I'm sure he experienced far, far more than that. But those are some of the things that he experienced. The Apostle James puts it this way in his letter to the churches. Chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. We need endurance on our path along the narrow way. We need endurance. So these things come into our lives. That's uh, J.B. Phillips' New Testament in modern English. I found out many years ago. I thought it was a terrific uh, translation of what that meant. That to invite them in as friends, these things. Quite a way of looking at it, but there we are. Let me encourage you this morning. If you're finding your Christian life hard going, you're on the right path. Hallelujah. You are on the right path. Secondly, let's think about the cost of being on the narrow way and weigh this against the destination. Yeah? Count the cost on the narrow path and weigh it against the destination. I don't know about you, but have you ever been caught out when you're agreeing to something? You know, you, you go into a shop or you buy something or you... You uh, go to a company and you're purchasing something and uh, you agree on a price and you agree on the terms and conditions of the contract. It seems to me that uh, we've reduced them to T's and C's. That's what everybody calls them these days. But how important they are. <laughs> they are very important. But everybody's reduced them to just T's and C's. These are terms and conditions. And they're very important in any contract and any agreement that we enter into. And if we don't know the terms and conditions of the contract, we're in, we're in a bad place. I'm sure, well, I have anyway, I've been caught out before when I have thought, okay, I'll just look to this. I think the first higher purchase agreement I had when I was very young, it was one of those music centres, I think it was, <laughs> with the cassette and the radio and the turntable. I'm sure we all remember them. Oh, well, maybe not everybody, but some of us at least. <laughs> and... Um, that was bad enough, but then I entered into a contract buying a motorbike and uh, didn't really understand all about um, uh, hire purchase and uh, credit and interest. Didn't really understand all. Give me the bike. I want the bike. <laughs> That's all I was interested in. Then I got a letter some, I don't know how many months or maybe it was over a year, through the door to say, now Mr. Gann, you've just started to pay for the bike. <laughs> you've paid the interest off. I could have fallen down, I had no idea, I had a clue. But that's what it's like with terms and conditions and with agreements and contracts. And all of a sudden, everything's going swimmingly, you sign your name at the bottom, say, oh yeah, I've read everything, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden you're going further down the road and you think, something's happened, I have to go back now and, and you know, take the contract out and look. And the person in the company says, but did you read that part, Mr. Hunt? So I never saw that part. Well, that's an important part because you're telling me blah, 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 but you can't get this because you agreed to this part of the contract. So it doesn't start. That's your signature, isn't it? Yes, it is. On that day, yes. Well, you signed it, but you didn't read the detail. Of course, when we come to buy bigger things like a bike or a car, we really, really need to look, be vigilant, 
to look for the hidden costs. <laughs> they, in, they inject plenty of those into contracts uh, just to see if, if it can cut you out. So it's the, the detail, the small print. But this morning, thankfully, <clears throat> for us, there is no ambiguity in the teachings of Jesus. Aren't you glad about that? No ambiguity in his teachings. There's no hidden costs with Christ. There's no double agendas. There's no T's and C's in such small writing that you can't see it. There's nothing like that with Jesus. There is no ambiguity with him, thankfully. His price tag is upfront and central. So there's no doubt what he requires of us. He tells us plainly and in simple terms the agreement we have entered into, which includes the type of journey we encounter on the road that leads to eternal life. Aren't you glad this morning that Jesus is a realist? He is a realist. If you've ever met a realist, if you've ever met Jesus, you have met a realist. We, we can talk about us being realists, but he is a realist, completely and absolutely. Thankfully, he is. Jesus isn't some pie-in-the-sky dreamer. He's not some mystical guru. And he certainly isn't some wishy-washy philosopher. No, he tells us how it is and how it's going to be directly. No ambiguity. Plain and simply, this is it. If you want to, you choose. Jesus reminds us elsewhere in the Gospels of the cost of choosing eternal life. In Luke chapter 14, I do not have time to go into it, but he's teaching his disciples <coughs> about two important things, excuse me, of counting the cost. He uses two illustrations. One is somebody going to build a tower, and the other is a king going to war. So they're, they're quite simple illustrations. You know, you don't go to build something unless you know you're going to be able to complete it. Because as the Bible says, you're going to look like a bit of a fool. If halfway along the road, you discover, hmm, I don't actually have the funds or the materials or the resources to complete this project. So you're going to look rather silly at that point. He also talks about the king going to war. Well, the king has to determine the enemy that he's going against. He has to ask himself, okay, they've got more uh, troops than me. They've got more of this. Am I able to overcome? Am I able to win this battle? Or is, it, you know, is there any point in setting out on this road against this king? Or am I just going to fail? Am I going to waste the lives, precious lives, of my troops and my soldiers if I go against this king? Or is there a chance of me winning? I won't mention Culloden. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll leave that to you. There is no hope. Yeah? So when we, when we approach something, we have to count the cost. That's very important. To count the cost. In fact, there is a glaring example of that in our town. I don't know how many times you've passed the cathedral, the Inverness Cathedral, beautiful building. I passed it thousands and thousands of times. I came from the west side of the city, so I used to pass it numerous times a day. Beautiful building, beautiful grounds around it, and it is an absolutely beautiful building inside the cathedral. It's lovely. But actually, it was never finished. That building is not meant to look like the way it looks like today. No, it wasn't. In the 1800s, the bishop, Robert Eden, set out on a project to build that building, along with other people, not on his own, obviously, to get funds, to gather funds. To, he, was the, he was the bishop of the diocese of uh, Mary Ross and Keith Ness. He had a big remit. Um, so he set out to, to build this wonderful cathedral, but he never completed it. The cathedral should have two lovely, huge, big spires on those two backs. You know those two flat roofs at the front of it? There should be two spires shooting into the sky on that building. But there's not. And the reason why there's not is because he ran out of money, plain and simply. So he never completed the project, unfortunately. So there's a perfect example of somebody that set out to do something and to, you know, to build something, but actually he wasn't able to finish it. Think about it as you pass it by. The way of the world is easy, <clears throat> where we give allegiance only to ourselves and do whatever satisfies our fancy. And since it's the popular way to go, 
We need only to choose to follow the crowd. That's all we need to do. We don't have to do anything else. It's going that way, just to follow the crowd. Following the narrow path is not like this. It's hard. The narrow gate requires repentance. It requires faith. It requires self-denial. It requires an admission of what we are, that we deserve the condemnation of God. That is hard. And in fact, it is impossible without the grace of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's impossible. But when we do stop when we're at the cost, we must balance this against the destination. That's the important thing. Christ says, you look at the narrow gate, and even though it is hard, I want you to remember it's more desirable than the pleasures of destruction. <coughs> because in the end, it will bring the blessings of God and salvation for eternity. For eternity. And so, he says again, enter the narrow gate, because it is a desirable way. It is more desirable than the pleasures of of wickedness. So we see there is a choice to be made. There are consequences. Each of the roads lead somewhere. Yeah? They don't go nowhere. There is a destination for those roads. Foolish is the person who sets out on a journey and does not consider where it will end. You don't just step on the road and start walking. You've got to know your way and where you're going and what your destination is. You're foolish if you set out not knowing those things. In fact, there's a word called straveg. Are you familiar with that word? It's a lovely word, isn't it? Straveg. Which, plain and simply, it's an old Scots word, and it means to wander aimlessly. My dad would have said to me years ago, oh, I've straveged around this town for years, boy. But it means just to wander aimlessly. That's what straveg means. We're not wandering aimlessly. We have a definite path. It's called a narrow way. We have a definite destination. It's called heaven. That is our destination along the narrow way. We are not floating around like leaves on a river or clouds swirling around in the sky. No, we have an aim. Hallelujah. We have a path to follow. And we're rejoicing with Jesus, our King, on that path. He's with us on the path all the time. So we see that although it is hard, the destination weighed against is definitely worth it. In his book, The Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan gives us a very clear insight to the spiritual journey as he de describes Christians. That's the main character in his story, in his allegory. It's the main character. His name is Christian. And... He gives us a very clear so, insight into the journey along the narrow way to the celestial city. That's what it's called in John Bunyan's book, which was written in the 1600s. And if you've read The Pilgrim's Progress, you'll remember very well the dangers, the obstacles, and the characters that Christian encounters on the narrow way. However, at the end of Christian's journey was the celestial city. That's where he was heading for. Heaven itself. That was what's at the end. This destination made all the hardship of the journey more than worthwhile. When you read about his joy at seeing the celestial city. At last, he can see it in his sight. It's wonderful. I'd encourage you to read The Pilgrim's Progress. I've read it a few times myself. It's a great book. You get it in plain English. Or you can read it in the Old English if you want, which is very good. It takes a little bit longer to read, but it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful writing, wonderful prose. It's wonderfully written. But in the modern English, it's much easier. Definitely. Jesus wants us to understand that the broad way leads to destruction. It leads to destruction. Often he spoke of hell, a place reserved for the punishment, the eternal punishment, of those who forgot God characterized by the loss of all that is good. He likened it to darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, an endless torment of pain, and the fire that is never quenched. 
But if we're walking on the narrow way, we have nothing to fear in those words, although they are true for those on the broad path. Ours is not a dread of condemnation as we walk on the narrow way and as we head to heaven, but a rejoicing in our salvation and the wonderful promise of heaven. Hallelujah. Yeah. We have the King with us as we travel on the narrow way. We have rejoicing in our hearts. Finally, although we may sometimes feel alone as we walk the narrow path, separate from the world, we are encouraged that Jesus walks with us every single step of the way. He is our ever-present companion and help. <coughs> and as we walk, we have a song of rejoicing, not a dirge, a song of rejoicing which lifts us and helps us and gives us spring in our step as we walk the narrow way because Christ is with us. He is our song. We have a song of deliverance. Hallelujah. We have a song of love unknown, which, if you're a follower of Christ, you have experienced in some measure in a living reality in your life and on your journey along the narrow way. As Christian traveled to the celestial city, he had a song to sing. And an interesting fact when I was doing some research for this message was that John Banyan, who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, also wrote the hymn, To Be a Pilgrim. It's the only hymn that's accredited to him, which I didn't know. And it comes directly from the second part of the Pilgrim's Progress story, which I didn't know either. So I just want to read you the first verse of that hymn, To Be a Pilgrim, or He Who Would Valiant Be. There's two, two ways of calling it. So, He Who Would Valiant Be, Against All Disaster, let him in constancy follow the master. There's no discouragement shall make him once relent his first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. The prophet Isaiah, speaking by the Spirit of God, tells us that we will walk on the highway of holiness. The narrow road is the highway of holiness, folks. Jesus is walking that road with us. And just remember, we could not walk on that road if he was not with us. Because as Robbie has reminded us, he is our holiness. He is our righteousness. We could never, ever do that on our own. That's why we need to stay close to him along that road. And as we walk in holiness along the narrow way, Christ walks with us every step. His promise still stands true. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Lo, I am with you always, and I will be with you to the end of this age. On one account in the gospel, Jesus invites his disciples to enter a boat. You remember the story? On the Lake of Galilee. And he tells them that they're going to the other side. Jesus says that. We're going to the other side. You're coming into the boat on my invitation, and we're going to the other side. But as we know, the going gets rough, and the disciples... Um, they, well, they get fearful. They get frightened because things are not quite working out the way that they hoped they might be. <laughs> it's kind of like that, isn't it, on your walk? Mm -hmm. Things don't turn out the way you want them to turn out. All of a sudden, you're confronted with problems, difficulties, obstacles, trials, temptations. Ah, help. Yes, <laughs> Jesus is there. Help me. Hallelujah. That's the shortest prayer, isn't it? Help me, Lord. Yeah. He's right there. And that's what it was like for the disciples that day. They lacked faith in the Master's ability to take them safely to the far shore. And as we travel on the narrow way, we can be assured of the companionship of Christ. That he is the one who will take us safely to heaven. As we trust in his finished work and as we put our faith in his promises. Because he said, we're going to the other side. They never put their faith in the words that he said, they looked at the storm and the difficulties that were they were encountering. They were encountering those difficulties. They were real. As all difficulties and problems are real in our lives. We make no small thing of those. But nevertheless, believe in Christ. Put your faith in his promises to see you through all of those. When I first became a Christian, which was a number of years ago, actually 29 this year, one of my favourite hymns, I haven't sung it for a long time actually, and I'm not going to sing it, 
<laughs> was, I serve a risen Savior. I love that hymn. It has these words of truth in it. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, we are still in that boat. We're still in the boat. As it were, we've not reached the far shore as yet. We haven't reached the celestial city as yet. We're still on our pilgrimage through this wilderness. We're still fighting the good fight. Hallelujah. We're still contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. We still have to pick up our cross daily and follow the master on the narrow way and contend with the world, the flesh and the devil. We are wielding the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God and engaging our adversaries through the weapon of all prayer. Narrow is the way and difficult is the journey that leads to eternal life and few find it. But once we've counted the cost and made the choice, we go on our way rejoicing. Jesus says in John 16:33, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, many. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. He has overcome the world, and we're in him. Be encouraged. Jesus has overcome every obstacle, trial, and difficulty that we face. And when we're working closely with him on the narrow way, we will get through and over these too. We will arrive at our destination of heaven with Jesus, our King, for all eternity. Amen. 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 Thank you.